me record this. All right, so everyone, this is going to be our first tutorial into the um, tools and software that we will be using in this course um, and to prepare you for the lab um, that you'll be working on hands on. So these tutorials will be mostly um, like introductory and it will show some details, but I would, I'll try to make them brief and won't um, take up too much time. Um, so it'll give you a good direction to uh, look for things when you're stuck, and then um, you, you'll still have to do a little bit of learning on your side. Um, so today we're going to go over, first we're going to go over like a short introduction to Docker. Um, so if you can do me a favor, and if you've at least um, used Docker or have heard of it before, can you raise hand in the Zoom session so I can get an idea on how many people are actually have used this before. Okay, so not many of you. All right, um, so I'll get started on this. So an overview of Docker. So if, if you've not heard of Docker before, it's basically like a, you can think of it as a sandbox. It's not necessarily a VM, which you might have heard of before, where you can run another operating system. Um, Docker allows you to kind of get rid of the oper operative, op I'm sorry, OS level, um, and then you can only install the bare minimum software um, that you'll be using. Uh, sometimes it comes with a GUI if you set up correctly. Um, so the advantage of containers or Docker is that you can run many containers simultaneously on a given host, and then they can also talk to each other. Um, containers are also lightweight and um, it contains everything and it's not as clunky as a virtual machine. Um, it, the best part of Docker is that you can package everything neatly um, in one file or you can push it up to uh, something like Docker Hub, which is similar to GitHub and all of its dependencies will be available to uh, whoever uses it next. And as an overview of the architecture, Docker uses a client server um, architecture, right? So on the left, you have a client. Um, so there are two types, at least um, the most popular ones are just a command line client, which is probably the one you're gonna be using the most. And then there's also a Docker desktop client. I haven't used that myself. So if, you, if you're if you more comfortable with like a um, GUI interface to bring up your containers, you could also use that. Um, and then you also have the server side of Docker, which handles all the containers and images. We'll touch on what those are later on. Um, you can also grab available containers or images from the registry, which is Docker Hub, where um, people make their uh, containers publicly available. So images are read-only templates with instructions on creating a container. So you can think of it as like when you're installing an operating system, you have something called the, the image of the OS. So it's similar here. Uh, you can create your own images or you can use ones that are um, what use ones that are published in the registry. So for example, you can use you can build an image based on an Ubuntu image, but you install all the uh, other necessary um, dependencies that you need, for example, like Python or ROS um, in our case, and then you can make that a new image, it's, which is derived from another image. So the easiest way to build your own image is you, you start from a Docker file, and we'll go into the syntax of Docker file uh, later on. And basically, you can think of it as a step-by-step -step, uh, instruction for Docker to build the image. Um, it makes it lightweight and then it's fast uh, compared to other virtualization methods. Um, and then next we'll have 
containers, which are kind of like the runnable instances of an image, right? So you have a script on how to create the, these containers. Uh, and once you have that, you can create them, you can start, you can stop um, different containers. You can have the same image, but you can run two instances of it. Um, so they're using the same image, but are separate containers. Uh, you can connect containers to networks, which allows them to talk to your host or talk um, with each other, right? Um, and then also containers are isolated. That means that ev everything you've created in it by default is removed once you're done. Uh, when you remove the container, it will not exist and nothing will exist on your file system anymore. But you could also um, uh, use containers such that you can keep the files that you want uh, at a certain directory. And we'll talk about how to do that by mounting a volume um, so that you have you can edit the files locally on your machine and then ru actually run the code inside the container. Um, so I, I know that was pretty fast. Any questions so far? All right. Uh, yeah, Mac system. Okay, I'll, I'll cover that in, in the lab walkthrough a little bit next. So next we, we will uh, go over some of the common uh, commands that you'll be using in the command line client. Um, so the first one is Docker pull. This basically um, pulls an image from a repository or a registry that's, on, uh, that's available online. Um, so uh, when, once we release the slides, you can see that at the bottom here, I've left a link for all the references and then uh, it's actually the link to the documentation on Docker. And then if you need to see the actual details of a command, you can always click on that and go through it yourself. So this will um, basically create a container instance of a publicly available image. And the next one is Docker run, which is running a um, container. Um, basically it creates a writable container layer over your specified image. Um, and then it also starts it with the commands that you've given. Um, so for example, you can give it a name, you can have an interactive um, TTY session. Uh, you can also bind mount the volume, which makes the files available both on the host and inside the container. Uh, you can make it so that it automatically removes the container when you exit the container. Uh, you can also connect it to a network and publish the container's ports to a host so you can have communication over the network. And the next one is built, which is building an image from a Docker file. So once you've created the instructions on how Docker should handle building the image, it will, uh, you, can, you can give it the name of the Docker file and then um, basically it will build the image for you. Um, another one is Docker PS-A, which is probably the one that you'll use the most. So this shows you all the containers that are uh, that exist on your on your system. Uh, and there's also another one that's basically doing the same thing, but instead of showing you the containers, it shows you the images that you have. Um, and then Docker RM is used to remove one or more containers. Uh, if you didn't, uh, when you run the container, if you didn't set it to automatically remove, you'll have to use this to remove a container that you're no longer using. And there's the same uh, command RMI, but it's for images. So Docker exec is running a command inside a already running container. So if you've already brought up a container with Docker run, um, you can leave that running and then you can open another, for example, an interactive, interactive bash um, in, in that already running container. So you'll have two terminals that are available to you. Um, and then Docker CP is co copying um, files between a container and the local system. So the, it behaves like the Unix CP and it will have similar options for, uh, for example, copying recursively. Um, so there are two ways you can co uh, copy from inside the container to your host or the other way around. So you do that by specifying um, whether the source path is inside the container name and source path or if the destination is inside the container. 
um, and then we'll go over some basic Docker file syntaxes. So uh, Docker files are uh, instructions for Docker to build the images. Um, it's basically executing several command line instructions. And uh, in general, the format is you'll have um, the comment with the hashtag and then comment. Um, and then for the instructions, you'll have um, instruction and then arguments. So uh, people usually put the instruction in all caps so it's easier to read. Um, but as far as I know, I think you can, it's not recommended, but you, you don't have to have it all, cap, uh, all caps instructions. Um, and it must, so a Docker file must begin with a from instruction. So from the from instruction basically sp uh, specifies the parent image from which you are building. So example, for example, I can say from Ubuntu 20.04, or I can say from ROS, uh, some, some distro of ROS. And then the run instruction has basically, it's running a command. You can think of it as uh, automatically running a command line command. Um, so you have two, two forms. You have the shell form or the exact form. Um, so this uses the default bash, uh, the, the, the SH shell on Linux. And the next is the command, the CMD instruction. So these are very similar. Um, the, the, the difference between the two is that the run one, you can actually run what you put in, for example, app get install uh, for, for Linux, for, uh, for Linux or Ubuntu uh, images. And the CMD is more like you only have this exact form where you have to call it ex executable in, in, in this form. Um, and then you can only have one CMD instruction in the Docker file, and then only the last one will take effect. So it's it's the run one is more like for uh, installing all the de dependencies uh, packages that you need, and then at, at the at the end of the Docker file, you have a CMD for having a default for executing a container. So if you run a container. And you don't get, give it a CMD; it will uh, it will by default go into a bash session, um, or it could execute whatever you give it in the CMD command. Um, in in which case, if you decided to include an executable, uh, or, or sorry, if you decide to omit it, the executable in the CMD, you also have to specify an entry point instruction as well. So if you go to the uh, Docker file syntax references and documentation. Uh, if you need to write your own Docker file, um, it will be the, it will be a lot uh, in detail in explaining what all these commands do. Um, the next one is in the env uh, ver uh, env instruction. So it sets an env uh, environment variable in your image, and this will be. Persi it will persist through the entire Docker file when you're installing packages, and it will also persist when you run the container from the resulting image. Um, so, for example, if you want something uh, like an environment uh, variable only during installation, you can use the arg um, instruction instead. And this will not persist when you run uh, from the resulting image. And then a copy instruction, basically, it's similar to when you call Docker copy. Um, you can you can also call it in a Docker file when you need to uh, copy some files from your current build build context, which is the directory that you're running uh, Docker build from. Uh, you can copy it from the from your host system uh, into the new image that you'll be creating. <clears throat> so entry point. Uh, as we've touched on before, it's basically allows you to configure a container that will run as an executable, um, right? And then next we'll basically look at an example Docker file. So this is uh, at least a version of the simulation that we'll be using and then the Docker file that, it crea uh, that creates the simulation environment. So the top of the file, the first line is that you're 
um, building the new image based on some parent image, which in this case is ROS Foxy, which is a, a distribution of ROS2. Um, you specify the shell for, for the environment, which we're, we're going to be using Bash here. Um, so for example, you can use the run, <coughs> sorry, the run instructions to call um, app get, for example. So, um, so if you want the format to be neater, you can use the line escape at the end. Um, so you can have one liners in multiple lines and it's easier to see what packages are installing. Um, and then you can also do the same for pip, and, uh, PIP dependencies. Um, and then you can also call uh, commands like cloning a repo, going into a repo and then installing something. So when you call run, the CD commands here will not persist. So um, it will go back to its default works, uh, works, work direction, uh, work directory, um, even if you called CD in a run command. So basically everything in the run command, except for like modifying the file system, um, it will not persist. Um, and then here you'll see it's, uh, making a directory and then copying all the files from the current directory into a, a destination directory in the uh, in the container. And then last step here is we specify the work directory. So uh, once you run the uh, container from this image, you will be in the sim WS directory by default. And also the entry point we specified here is just a bash session. So once you executed the container, you'll just get an interactive bash, uh, bash session. And then next we'll talk about how to basically share files between containers and the host system. Um, <clears throat> so bind bound mounts a file or directory to the host on the host machine into a container. Um, the file directory is referenced by its absolute path on the host machine. And in contrast, a volume creates a new directory within Docker storage directory on the host machine. And Docker actually gets to manage that directory's contents. And you also have a temp file system mount, which is basically sharing the memory between uh, the container and your host system. So how do we start a container uh, where we can share the files. So there are two ways. When you call Docker run, you can uh, call the mount argument or the dash V argument. So the dash V argument, it combines all the options together in one field. So there are basically three fields that you have to uh, fill in and then they're separated by colons. Uh, so the first field is the path to the file directory on the host machine that you want to mount into the container. And then the second field is the path that you want it to mount it, uh, want it mounted in the container. Um, and the third field is optional. Um, so if you look at the document uh, documentation on mounting, you'll see what options are available. So mount is uh, similar, but it's uh, basically a, like a long form of dash V where you have to use uh, key value pairs and separated by coma. So th the type uh, you can change if it's a bind mount or a volume or a tempfs mount, and you can also specify the source and the destination like you did uh, for dash V. And Docker networks are basically uh, a network created on the host. Um, it could be it could be the host network. It could be a, a network that's only accessible for Docker, um, so you can create a network, you can connect containers to a specific network, uh, or you can uh, share, basically share the host network with a container when you run it. Um, and the last one is the last tool that you might uh, use is Docker Compose. So you can think of it as you, you're writing one uh, configuration file, and then it could create containers for you. Either it's from uh, the registry or from a Docker file, um, and then you can bring up multiple uh, Docker containers at the same time, and you can create networks in it. 
and then you can also um, connect containers to it. Uh, and then you can also specify arguments when you run the container all in one YAML file. So we might use this later on. Uh, you might choose to use Docker Compose later on. And then if you're interested, you could look at the document, again, look at the documentation and see how to install it um, and, and, and um, how to basically create this configuration file. Um, so again, if you're, if you're stuck in understanding uh, any of the tools that we need to use in the lab, you should just check out uh, the Docker documentation. It's pretty comprehensive. It covers a lot of things that you'll probably need. Um, so yeah, that's that's the Docker introduction. Any questions on this part? Okay, um, then I'll move on to um, the uh, intro introduction to Ross. Maybe, uh, maybe you can talk about the submission, like Docker Hub. Yeah, I'll do it ab uh, after this. Okay. okay. Um, so again, uh, you m many of you might have uh, used Ross one before. So I want to see, again, if you can raise your hand if you've used ROS1 or even ROS2 before, so I can get an idea of. OK, so a lot, of, a lot more of you have used ROS before. OK, so I'll, I'll make sure the uh, concepts are a little bit faster then. Um, so the overview. Uh, most of you might already know this, um, the, the robot operating system, it's supposed to be peer-to-peer -peer, um, and then distributed multilingual, meaning that you can do it in C++, Python, MATLAB, Java, I think even C-sharp now. Uh, it's supposed to be lightweight, free, uh, and open source. Um, so between ROS1 and ROS2, uh, the first change is that they updated the language standards for ROS2, so you need to have at least C++11 and Python 3 for ROS2 now, which is great. Um, it uses off-the-shelf middleware now. It supports discovery, transport, and serialization over DDS, um, so it's a little bit faster and, and neater than ROS, uh, ROS1's middleware. And it has a tighter Python integration now, so uh, if you've used Python in ROS1, you'll remember that the API is not in the same style as the C++ one. Um, and then it's very loosely integrated. So you can basically, um, basically the, 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 uh, the, the way that you run Python notes and C++ notes, we'll talk about what notes are later, are, are very different. Um, now that we have a tighter Python integration, the launch files are now in Python. Um, and then it also has real-time capabilities since it, they changed the middleware for ROS. And the most important one is the API change, which means that uh, ROS1 code will not just automatically run in ROS2 now. So uh, we'll also go over some of these API changes. Um, so the, the, uh, if you're familiar with ROS1, these concepts of nodes, uh, topics, messages, services, uh, actions have not changed. So on the high level, they're still the same. And the one that maintains everything, like the publishing, subscribing, calling a service, calling an action, is still maintained by the ROS graph. So it's basically a network of ROS2 elements. So it pro processes the, the, da uh, data, the data together at one time. It encompasses all executables and the connection between them, and you can visualize them. Again, uh, for all these concepts, I've included a link at the bottom right if you want to check out the documentation from Ross. Uh, can you clarify what you mean by tighter? So the way that um, launch files works, uh, so the first point is that launch files are now written in Python. So if you remember in ROS1, it used to be XML files where there are very limited options on what you can do by uh, including 
like an argument for argument for uh, launching a node and arguments for using parameters. So it's a Python script now, which means that you can use Python libraries to bring in whatever you want. Um, and that you can, it, it's basically launching nodes are a lot, um, a lot flexible, a lot more flexible now. Uh, and the second one is the way that nodes are created. So now both in C++ and Python, they both um, basically when you create a node in, inherits a node parent uh, class in both C++ and Python. Um, so a lot of the APIs are, are, are more similar across both C++, uh, C++ and Python. Does that make sense? All right. Um, and then the another very important element of ROS2 and ROS1 are basically nodes. So each node in ROS is basically an executable either in C++ and Python or other languages. And then each node have a very specific uh, purpose. So this is how uh, ROS is modular. Um, and each node can send and receive data to each other via topics. So that we'll talk about subscription and publishers uh, later on. And some, some of the command line commands that you could do with nodes is that uh, first one, you can basically do ROS to run a package name, executable name now. So if you remember in ROS one, if you don't have a launch file, you have to uh, basically do ROS core to start the core service for ROS one. And you don't have to do that anymore. And you can directly call ROS to run, uh, to run a node. And if nothing is subscribing uh, to the, or if it's, for, for example, if it's uh, the only communication is through topics, if nothing is subscribing to the node nodes topic, it's not gonna run uh, anymore to waste unnecessary resources now. So it's a little bit easier to run nodes. Now you can just start start them all and without running ROS core now. Uh, and you has, also have ROS2 node list, which lists all of the nodes that are currently running. Um, and then ROS2 node info, uh, it will show you information of a given node name. So these two are still very similar to ROS1, which are equivalent basically to the ROS node command in ROS1. And the next is topics. So topics is basically how nodes communicate with each other. Um, so this concept is still the same as the one in ROS1. So you basically either publish to a topic or subscribe to a topic, and then the messages are exchanged through topics between nodes. And uh, also a node can publish to a topic, but also multiple nodes can subscribe to the same topic. So it doesn't have to be uh, point to point. It could be one to many, many to one, uh, it, all, it could also be uh, many to many. Uh, so these are some of the commands that you might find useful for looking at um, topics. So RQT graph it basically shows you like a graph of how nodes and topics are communicating with each other. Um, it also sh will show you the type of messages and all the other ones are still very similar to uh, the ROS topic command in ROS1. So the syntax has changed, but it will mostly do the same things like list. It will echo, basically shows you what's being published on the topic. Uh, it could You could call info to see who's publishing to the topic or who's subscribing to the topic. Um, and then this one is also useful uh, when you, so messages are being communicated on topics. And then if you need to know what fields are in a message, you can do ROS2 interface show to see the format for uh, that message. And um, pub basically is publishing to a topic um, in the command line. And then you also have HZ, which shows you the uh, frequencies that the messages are being published on a topic. And then the next ones, I'm gonna go over them a little bit faster because we rarely use them in this course, but it's useful to know that these exist. So services are another way of communicating. So before with the publishing and subscribing model, um, the publisher is constantly publishing messages or 
publishing whenever it could. And the subscriber is always listening uh, to the on the topic to whatever's being published. Um, you can also have a service uh, service model, which basically is a client server model through the request response uh, model. Basically, you, you won't get a response unless you put in a request. And then the service server will handle the incoming request and then decide what to do with the information that it has. And then it'll return whatever the uh, client node needs in a response. It could also, again, be uh, the same service. And then you, you could have multiple clients for the same service. And then the service server will um, deal with the requests in the queue. Um, so again, there are some commands that you can use to quickly identify um, what does the service, uh, what, what, what services are there, what types are there. Uh, you can list them all, you can call it in the command line. You can also show that what type of data that it requests, that it needs for a request and what data will return for um, for a response. Um, param we actually skip to actions first. I'll come back to parameters after this. So actions is a, a little bit more complex type of, uh, the model is very similar to services. So you, you also have, a, so you also have like the request response um, model, but in addition, you will separate basically an action into uh, two services and a feedback topic. So in this way, you can put in a request for a goal and then not only get a response for if your goal has received, uh, if your goal request was received by the action server, they'll actually all, uh, give you a continuous feedback on another topic, which means that you can monitor how the serv server is doing. Um, and then at the end, when whatever functionality you built in is done processing the request, it will also send uh, a response through the result service back to the action client. Um, so this is uh, another type of uh, models that Ross has. So I'll go back to um, parameters. So, so ROS parameters are basically a configuration values for nodes, um, basically a setting for nodes. Um, you could have integers, floats, booleans, strings, uh, and lists. And then through the command line, you will have um, basically listing out all the parameters that are, are live on whatever's running right now. And you can also uh, get a parameters value from a, a node. And then you can also set a parameter value uh, for, for a node. And then you can also use a YAML file to define the parameters. Um, other than setting it in, in the command line, you could also set it either in a launch file or a YAML file. It's useful to have um, a parameter file because it's easier to basically have all the parameters in one place while you're tuning how, how, how you want your node's performance to be. You could also set parameters for multiple nodes in one file instead of set it, changing it in, across multiple uh, executables. Um, so the robotics backend has a really good, so this is a better tutorial on how to use YAML for ROS2 parameters than the actual tutorials that comes with uh, ROS. So check it out if, you, if you're using parameters. Um, and then getting the ROS parameters programmatically. So if you've used ROS parameters in ROS1, it's, it is slightly different now. So the example here is in Python. So now you have to declare a parameter first when you are um, uh, uh, initiating a node. So as you can see, it's calling self.declareParameter. Uh, oops. This again is from the tighter integration from Python that we mentioned before. So now your nodes are basically inheriting from a node parent class. So you have these uh, functions that uh, are just available to you when you inherit from a node. Um, so you have to declare a parameter first by, by the name that you set your parameter and then you can actually get the value and then do whatever you want with it. Um, you could also get multiple parameters at once by giving it a list and then it'll return a tuple, for example, in Python. 
the API is similar in C++, so I've also um, linked two tutorials on uh, getting and setting ROS2 parameters uh, in Python and in C++. Okay. All right, so the next concept is basically a workspace. Um, this is still uh, very similar to the one in ROS1. So it's a directory containing all the ROS2 packages. Um, and, and before you use ROS2, it's still very nece uh, still necessary to source your ROS2 installation workspace in the terminal. Um, and then this will make all ROS2's packages available for you in that terminal. Um, so we'll touch on so we'll touch on this concept of overlay and underlay um, next. So the 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 same concept still applies. If you remember, you have to source uh, a setup bash for getting all the ROS commands, and you also have to set a uh, source the setup bash that you have for your workspace. So all the packages in the workspace are available to you, and we'll go over that a little bit later. Um, and creating a con uh, creating a workspace is still very similar. Um, and then basically you still do this, um, create a workspace directory with a SRC directory inside it. And then you put all the packages still in the SRC uh, directory. And now we have uh, raw stab is the default way to resolve all the dependencies. I think it's still the, still the same from ROS one. Basically, if you've set up your uh, packages correctly and list out all the uh, dependencies, Rostep will uh, f automatically find all the um, will find all the necessary uh, recipes for installing um, the dependencies that you need, and they'll install it. Um, so now we have a new build tool for ROS2. So if you if you've used ROS1 before, it was called Cat Can Make. So now we have something that's called Col Colcon. Um, and then it, the, the way it works is very still very similar. Um, basically, how you build the workspace is you call it from the root of your workspace, Colcon build, and then you can have arguments. Um, so the first one packages up to basically only builds the package that you want, uh, that you've specified instead of uh, all the entire workspace. This will build the package itself and also all the dependencies that it needs. Um, and then you can also call symlink install. Basically, this is uh, useful for Python nodes. And you have every time you change a Python script, if you don't have this um, basically a symlink, um, you'll have to rebuild every time so that it's put into a different directory where ROS actually runs things. And the last one. Uh, shows the console output while building. This is not really useful because you can still find it in the log directory. And once you finish building your workspace, you will see uh, basically these four directories, build, install, logs, uh, SRC. So you already know SRC is where your source files are, source files are um, and the install directory is where the workspace setup files are. You usually don't need to touch anything in build and don't need to touch anything in log unless you want to see what, what went on during the build process. Um, and now uh, an important part is the overlays and underlays. So the main ROS2 environment we refer to as an underlay, this basically gives you access to all the necessary uh, core packages that you need to run ROS2. And whatever custom workspace you create, we refer to as overlays. So by sourcing the overlays, you not only get access to the core ROS2 environment, you also get uh, access to all your packages on top of it. So after you build um, or after you build a new workspace and you want to run something, so you have to source the underlay first. So this is basically, for, for example, for a Foxy install, this is where the setup.bash will be. So by sourcing this, it will give you all the access to the basic ROS2 stuff. And then in your the custom workspace that you've, you've created, the, 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 um, the overlay setup.bash is called install slash local setup.bash. By sourcing this, you'll get access to the workspace you've just built and all the packages in it. There is also, um, 
and install slash setup.bash. So inside of local setup, you have setup.bash also in your install directory. This is basically combining the two, but it's sourcing the underlay where the packages are built and then also the overlay. So usually you can install, instead of calling these two, you could just call this one and it will also give you access to the ROS2 environment. Um, you might be tempted to leave this sourcing commands in your bash RC if you're familiar. Bash RC is basically the default commands that gets executed when you open a new bash session. Um, so I highly recommend against this because I've seen so many times that <laughs> a teammate left uh, one of these commands in in the bash RC and then another teammate does not know why changing their code and rebuilding back packages are not uh, are not affecting how the how the nodes are actually running because it's sourcing the wrong overlay. Maybe it's sourcing an old workspace that you're not working in anymore. Um, so I would suggest just calling these whenever you need to run something instead of put, putting it in as a default somewhere. And then once you've uh, the lower uh, once you've created a workspace, um, you can put in your packages, uh, ROS2 packages. So basically it contains all the configuration for nodes and also all the source code for nodes. Um, package creation in ROS2, it uses a, a, a new system called Ament. Ament. Um, you can create packages with either CMake or Python um, or both. And uh, I'll put in the link here to uh, once I upload the slides to basically the tutorial on how to create a package. Um, so there are minimum requirements on what has to be in a package. For for example, for CMake packages, you need to have a package.xml. So this is still very similar to the ROS1 package uh, meta info. And you also need, need to have a CMake list. This is for CMake to know how to build the code. And then in Python packages, you have um, still the package.xml, and then you have some um, uh, extra stuff like setup.py, and it contains the instruction for how to install the package. And then you have setup.cfg, which is required when a package has executables. So ROS2 run can find them. Um, and then another directory with the same name as your package uh, with and then init.py in it, which is used by ROS2 tools to find your package. So you can see if you're familiar with Python packages, this is a very familiar setup. Uh, it's basically a ROS package in Python could also work as a, just a package in Python itself. Um, and the simplest Python, uh, the simplest package in ROS might have a file structure like this. So for CMake, you have these two files. And then for Python, you have the directory uh, with setup.py, the package.xml, and then you also have something that's created for you. I'm actually not sure what this is for, but <laughs> it, it, when you create a package in Python, that will also be there. Uh, I'm pretty sure this file is also empty most of the time. Um, and a single workspace can contain many packages. Um, you can have different types of pa packages in the same workspace, but you cannot have nested packages. So um, the best practice is to have a, basically a source folder within your workspace and then you put different packages in there. Uh, and then for example, it could look like this when in the SRC folder you have multiple packages and then you can even have uh, different types of packages with different languages. Um, and create a package, you can go to the SRC folder and then basically these are the um, basic commands they could use to create either a Python package or a CMake package. Um, again, I'll include a link here. There are um, some more options that you can have here to basically include also the dependencies in this command. Um, so the package contents, it's still mostly the same. I think the only change that uh, that's most significant is for Python package. It's inside the, so inside my package, there's also a my package directory with the same name and the Python source files are in there now. 
uh, instead of maybe script as before in ROS1. So uh, customizing package.xml, this is the, again, the meta file for your package. Um, and then you fill in the name and email for the maintainer, license, et cetera. You could also uh, fill in your dependencies under the pen tags. There are many of them. Um, if you want to know what the differences are, there's a, there's a documentations on what they do. Um, so these will be basically tracked by Rostab when you resolve the dependencies. And if a package is missing, it will install it automatically. And for Python packages, you also need to fill in setup.py, uh, the same thing that you filled in in package.xml for description, version, maintainer licenses. Um, you'll need to match these exactly. You also need to match the package name and the version that you have in package.xml. Um, so I think we're almost running out of time. I will probably skip these code walkthrough because you can also find them online. I'll again include the links here, but the big, big takeaway is that when you see the API change in ROS2, um, where it's importing something called RCLPy, this is now the ROS2Py uh, library for Python. Um, and then when you create a when you create a new node, you basically inherit from this node class here, which will give you uh, functions that you inherit from the node class, like creating a publisher, creating a timer. Uh, and like getting, getting, um, getting parameters like we've we've seen before, and you still do the same callback uh, callback functions, which basically when you create a publisher or a a, a timer or, or sorry, not a publisher, when you create a timer or a subscriber, the callback function is called whenever this gets invoked, like you got a new message or the timer ticks, and in the main in the main function, you'll, you'll have to have this uh, format here now because you specify an entry point in uh, when you're building your Python package. So basically what you do is you call rclpy.init with a, whatever args you give it in the main, usually it's empty. Um, and then you create, you inst instantiate your node class and then you call spin um, with your node here. So that's how you basically run a new node in Python now. Um, and then dependencies, again, it's in package.xml. Um, so these are, for example, rclpy is important because you need it to run a Python node. And then entry points in setup.py is basically telling it where to uh, call the node. So in uh, Python's case, this is basically the main function. Um, this is already covered. So re basically resolving dependencies for a package. And then if it's listed on the ROS index, it's you, it's usually there is a recipe for ROS app to install it. Um, and then the sub subscriber, similarly, um, it basically the callback method is still there. When you get a new message, you get basically a listener callback where you do something with the new message. Um, and then lastly, launch files. Uh, so now that we've moved to ROS2, uh, launch files are basically now Python files. Um, you could still use XML files, but that's mostly for migrating from ROS1, but it's recommended to use a Python file. Um, so it's still the same way where you make a directory called launch in your uh, package and then create a launch file. And then for example, um, Again, I'll, I'll add some links to examples and um, what every everything does in in, in the imports. Um, the the basically the the method the, the function that you have to fully define is called generate launch description, and then um, and at the end it will have to return LD, which is a launch description class here that you've imported from launch. Um, so for example, you can have configurations, you can have um, notes that you define by basically calling the note that you've imported and you can give it the package, the executable the names, and also the parameters, which could be um, basically a path to your YAML file that you're using. Um, you can also have arguments. Um, you basically, these are all creating like different notes, different notes, different notes. 
And then at the end, it's the launch description is basically adding whatever node you need to uh, launch in this launch file and then returning it at the end. So that's basically what a launch file looks like now. Um, so again, for, for a detailed tutorials on ROS2, I kind of went over these very quickly. Um, there's one from uh, ROS official. Um, the, this one is not as, not as in detail as I would like because we're still in a, basically a transition phase from ROS1 to ROS2. Um, the robotics backend have really good tutorials on uh, including writing code and then creating packages, etc. cetera. Um, so that's also a very good resource. Um, and then lastly, I'll walk over, basically do, uh, um, basically I'll, I'll, I'll talk about lab one that we'll, we'll be doing today. So uh, it's already released on GitHub Classroom. I see a couple of you have already joined. So you can go to Canvas. We have released an assignment and then there's a link where you can basically join the GitHub Classroom repo and then you can link your GitHub account. So we'll have track, we'll keep track of everyone in the class. Uh, it's due in a week on uh, January 19th before class on three o'clock, 3 p.m. Um, let me see if I can share the um, GitHub Classroom page so we can see what's in there. Um, I like the, 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 actually the handout so we can see what we'll have to do in this lab. Okay, I think it's just the right page. Um, so when you go on GitHub Classroom and um, uh, that link is different, Rahul. So the one you sent in chat, it's not the same link as they will join for, for the assignment. So, so just go to Canvas in the description, there's a link you can join the, uh, basically accept the assignment. And once you accept it, it will create a repo for you um, that's accessible by us and by you. So you can directly commit and make your changes to that repo. Um, that's how we are basically doing some code submission. Um, and then what it will do is we will cre create a repo from this template here, which is bare minimum. Uh, for, for this lab, there won't be a skeleton, but for uh, other labs later on, we'll also have the skeleton code in the template. So when you, when you get the uh, repo, it will have the lab handout and all the necessary stuff that you need. So for this lab, um, it's mostly going through a Docker workflow for ROS2 and then creating packages, nodes, and launch files. So basically what I went over in the tutorial. Um, so this might take some time if, you, if you're completely new, but, um, but it will take maybe I'll say like three to four hours. Um, and then what you'll have to do is basically, first of all is getting Docker and then running a container um, that's based on ROS um, so that you'll mount a, a directory on your, on your computer to uh, a, a directory in the Docker container. And then you'll, you'll then work inside Docker. Um, and then you can, so I've recommended you to, uh, to, to install Tmux. And then if you're not familiar with Tmux, basically what it allows you to do is in the same uh, terminal, you can have multiple bash sessions um, so Tmux is one option. If you're familiar with screen, you can also use it or whatever gives you like multiple acts, uh, multiple bash sessions sorry, in, could you say that again? sorry, in the same, in the same, uh, in the same container terminal. Um, and then once you've, once you've started a container that's based on the ROS official di distribution, you should already have all the access to basic ROS2 stuff inside. So what you'll have to do is basically you have to create a package, you have to create nodes. Um, there are certain, some requirements here that you have to follow. Um, you also need to create launch files and then and the parameter file if you want. Um, and finally is tagging and pushing your image to Docker Hub. So what you'll have to do is to go to Docker Hub, which is basically the registry for uh, registry for Docker where um, the repos will be, um, will be uh, 
will be available for everyone. Um, and then you'll have to create an account on Docker Hub with a Docker ID. Um, and then you have to set up a public repo um, and then push the image that you've created that includes all the workspace uh, packages and notes to, uh, to that. And then basically you'll have to fill in, uh, there's a submission.md. You can just fill in these information here. And then there's a couple of written questions um, you'll have to fill in and then just directly commit to the GitHub Classroom repo that's cr um, created for you. And then we'll do the grading from it there. Yeah, again, the, the link that Rahul sent is not for invitation to the, I'll, uh, so if you go to Canvas, this link, um, I've also posted that in the chat. This link is where you can go and accept the accept the assignment, and then um, basically link your GitHub account to the name that we have in the roster. Um, so this way, we'll, we'll it's easier for us to manage all the code, and then you all start from the same basic template. All right. Any questions? I have one question. Um, yeah. So if we currently have ROS1 installed on our system, do you expect there will be difficulties getting ROS2 to work without uninstalling it? Oh, it's all going to be in Docker, so it won't okay. interfere with any of the packages on your host system. Perfect. Thanks. Um, oh, one more thing I forgot to mention. So for next time, the tutorial will be basically on how to run the F110 simulation in Docker. Uh, where your next lab is going to be in the simulation for emergency breaking. So I'll also walk through and do a demonstration on how to bring up the actual um, GUI for the simulation. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. I'll hand it back to Rahul. Okay, so I think that that was a, a pretty quick tour of um, 